It's good to be with God's people as we uh, have fun, as we learn, and, uh, and as we grow in Christ. Our hope is really as a church that we are all being led in that growing relationship with Jesus. So welcome to the church. We're glad that you're here. Hopefully you feel the, the love of a, of a real family. That's our goal. We're not a business. We're a family. We really don't want anyone to think that we're a business or a service. We're a family of people. We're God's family. And it just so happens that God is using this family to make a difference in the lives of people. And that is our goal. That's our hope is that God's mission would come alive in us, that we would actually make a real difference in people's hearts, in their lives, in their spiritual journeys, that we would be able to connect people to the Father heart of God, and that they would begin to feel that intense, passionate love of God. God loves people so much that he gave his only son to die on a cross to reunite and connect his family back together, not only with him, but with each other. And so with that, I want you to open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 9 as we continue our journey in this series called Jesus Changes Everything. I encourage you to use the questions at the end of the sermon notes so that you can apply God's word to your life and have real conversations about the content of what we're going to be speaking about. It's really meant for really mature Christians and people who have just come into their faith. And you know what? Honestly, these questions can help you in your life if you don't even follow Jesus yet. Because our hope is that you'll find and discover that wherever you are on the path, that you can apply God's word to your life at whatever part of the path, whatever part of the journey you're on. Um, God has a passion for people. And I think the more that you get to know who God is, you discover that his passion is actually overwhelming. <laughs> it, it, it actually... It's bigger than any of our passions combined, and it's bigger than any church's ability to contain. His passion to reach people, really to reach people who are far from him, reach people who are hurting, reach people who may have grown up close, but they've wandered. God loves people. He loves his sons and his daughters. In fact, I think about God's intense, passionate love for people and I relate it to my intense, passionate love for my daughter. And I, it's hard for me to wrap my mind around this, that God loves Harper more than I do. That God loves my wife more than I love my wife. It's just intense. He's so in love with the idea of you coming back into relationship with him. That he's willing to pay a costly sacrifice to make it happen. And that's where I want to pick up this morning uh, in, Luke, excuse me, in Mark chapter 9 to, do, to really help us prepare for what God wants to do in us as we join Jesus on his mission. One of the slogans that we've said is along this journey through the book of Mark is that Jesus is changing everything. And he changes us. He starts the journey of transformation in our lives. Hearts And God's mission, his first step, is really to reach us, to get to where we are. In fact, there's a story in the book of Luke in chapter 19 where Jesus makes a big difference in the life of a tax collector by the name of Zacchaeus. Anybody know that, uh, that, that story? This guy who uh, is, is a tax collector. It's a hated role in society. Anybody like having your taxes taken out of your paycheck? Anybody? You just love it when you see all those dollars go to Uncle Sam. Well, uh, that was the same feeling that people had back then. And Zacchaeus had an encounter with Jesus that transformed him. So much so that he said, I want to give up to half of my possessions to make right all the ways that I've cheated people because of all of the unjust practices that they would collect taxes back then. <coughs> and Jesus says something very interesting in Luke chapter 19. He says, today salvation has come to this house. Later in 10, it says, for the Son of Man came to, that's purpose language, that's mission language, came to seek and to save the lost. God has a mission, and his mission is to reach you, to bring salvation to your house, to bring restoration to your life, to bring reconciliation to your relationships. He wants to do a work of transformation in your hearts. And I'm telling you the answer to every single problem in the world is Jesus. It starts when God gets a hold of us 
and forgives us of the sin that exists in us, the ways that we have messed up. It's amazing to me when an organization or a family or a business really grabs a hold of a mission and they just go after it with all their heart, kind of like Royal Family Kids Camp. They go after kids hurting uh, in hard places, and they are effective because they know what their mission is. And I want our church to know what our mission is. Actually, it's the same mission of Royal Family Kids Camp, to go after the people that God wants us to reach. But we'll only be as effective as we understand that God has not only an end, but a process that God is using. Because he's not just interested in saving and reaching the people like Zacchaeus or people who are outside of God's relationship. Now he wants to continually disciple us. He wants to sculpt us and to shape us into the image of Jesus. One of the organizations that I'm super impressed by and now I have to figure out more about because we've hired two of them to join our staff in the last year is the Marines. Do we have any Marines in the house? Okay, that was not a Marine-like answer, Todd. I was right. This is the Marine identity statement. The Marine Corps defend the people of the United States at home and abroad. To do that, we make Marines who win our nation's battles and return as quality citizens. In other words, the mission actually shapes what they become. And God is the same. He has a mission, and his mission is actually going to shape who you are becoming. Their purpose statement is Marines are trained to improvise, adapt, and overcome any obstacle in whatever situation They are needed. They have the willingness to engage and the determination to defeat the enemy until victory is seized. Our mission statement as a church is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus because a growing relationship with Jesus changes everything. It it helps you know who God is. It helps you find the freedom that you need in your life to be who God's called you to be. It helps you discover your purpose in Christ, to know the gifts that he's placed inside of you. And, And the biggest reason is because once you've been in relationship with Christ, you don't even have to try. You will make a difference everywhere you go, everywhere you walk. Everything that you do will make a difference in the lives of people because the Holy Spirit is leading you and Jesus is working through you. You could be inside of the four walls of the church, but most of the time you'll be outside of the four walls of the church, being the church, making a difference in Orange County. And Orange County needs the mission of God right now. 54% of people do not have any religion, do not have any faith in God. That means one out of every two people that you interact with in this county does not know Jesus. How many of you know the mission is all around us? So let's look at some of the ways that God shapes us. How many of you want to be used by God? How many of you are prepared to be used by God? I want to talk about three ways that God prepares us to be used by him in his mission. Ways that he changes us and makes us more effective. Mark chapter 9 Verse 30 starts with, they went on from there and passed through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man. Now, the Son of Man is a title used to describe the mission of Jesus. The Son of Man. That's the title that Luke uses in verse 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So it's uniquely tied to his messianic mission, his mission to reunite people to Jesus. to the Father through his life, death, and resurrection. Here, here's how it's done. Is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. See, this is the second prediction that, that Jesus issues to, to his disciples, to those who are closest to him. There are actually three moments where Jesus announces his death. One in chapter 8, one in 9, and one in 10. Pastor John preached about the first prediction right after uh, Peter uh, claims that Jesus is the Messiah. That's when Jesus introduces the idea of death and suffering for the first time. And in each of these situations, there's a failure of the disciples to really get it or understand what's happening. Peter rebukes Jesus, remember that, He says, Jesus, how could you be Messiah and be heading to a cross? That is not what uh, God has for you. And Jesus literally has to say, get get behind me, Satan, because this is the path that God has set before me. In this passage, the disciples don't get it. They're ignorant. They're still, there's a lack of understanding. They don't understand what it is that God is doing. And it says that they're afraid to ask. Isn't that interesting? 
that they're afraid to ask. It's almost like they, they have heard the first prediction and they've actually, they actually know about it, but they prefer to stay in this mode of ignorance. Ignorance is bliss. I don't want to hear about the possibility of sacrifice Jesus or suffering. Of course, Mark is writing to Christians in Rome. And this is what Jesus introduces, this concept of his death and resurrection. And then the third time that he references the future, his future suffering and death is in uh, chapter 10, verses 33 through 34. And immediately after that, James and John want special seats next to Jesus. It, it's almost like Jesus presents to us the idea that there is, in order for us to follow God in the mission of Jesus, there, there, there must be a sacrifice before there's resurrection. And it really are, all starts with Jesus' life. In fact, Jesus is not asking any of us to do anything that is bigger than what he's already or will do for us. But he's asked us to embrace the idea that sacrifice and suffering is a part of this journey. Now, here's the interesting thing. A lot of people will come into Christianity and they know and believe that as they consume what God wants to do in their lives and hope that it, it allows for them to have upward mobility and upward progress, they sort of can tune out a lot of parts of Scripture. In fact, all of the New Testament talks about sometimes that the road can be tough. But I just want to remind us of the perspective that life is tough. That it doesn't matter what faith you're in or, or, uh, or what continent you're in, you will experience pain and suffering in different ways. But here's the difference. God will use your pain and suffering and redeem it. He will take whatever you give to him as a sacrifice and he will redeem it for eternal purposes. Nowhere else, no other faith is going to give that kind of reward for something that you have to deal with anyways. There's no philosophy or way of life that doesn't deal with the question, what about suffering? The difference is that God in his omnipotence, his omnipresence, his omniscience actually comes down to heaven. That his mission to reconcile you back to him comes down from heaven and onto earth and he is the first to be willing to walk that road to Jerusalem. You see, Christianity cannot be Christianity unless it goes through a cross. You see, this message is not a popular message because people, especially evangelicals, even Pentecostals, we prefer to talk about the resurrection. But there is no resurrection without death. How many of you know there are things in your life that just, let's just be frank, they've, they've got to die for you to experience real life? It says in Scripture that when a seed falls to the ground until it dies, there will be no rebirth. That's how the kingdom of God works. The disciples don't understand how God's work, God works. Oftentimes, I forget about this. I, 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 in my own stubbornness, I forget that this is how God works to bring resurrection into my life. Oftentimes, he asks me to give something up to voluntarily surrender, to walk the path of the cross, to give something to the Lord so that he can make something out of nothing, so that something can be crucified with Christ on the cross, so that the life of Christ can be birthed in me. We don't like that, but it's how God works. Sometimes things have to die for something really to be born. And that step of sacrifice is not something to be avoided. It's actually something to be embraced. Can I encourage the church this morning to embrace sacrifice, to embrace suffering, embrace the questions that God is asking of you. In this season, there may be things that he asks you to give up. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's time. Maybe it's talent. Maybe it's a week of your life to go hang out with hurting kids. Your sacrifice is going to make a difference for eternity. There is nothing that you will ever give up, that God doesn't pour back into your life in ways that you will never be able to grab hold of or even keep up with. Resurrection follows sacrifice. As Jesus asks us to walk the road of the cross, as we come through Capernaum, as we are on our way towards Jerusalem, if we want God to use us in his mission, we've got to be ready to give, to serve. Because this really is a mission 
that is the difference between life or death. I don't know if you saw the news that there was 17 people who died in this duck accident, this boat in Missouri. It struck close to home for me because for eight years I lived in Missouri. I'm from Washington State. I grew up in Seattle, but God detoured me (laughs) through Missouri. And uh, as they say, they're misery. Anyways, um, if you're from Missouri, I don't apologize. (laughs) The humidity is insane, but the lightning bugs are really cool. Um, And... I can't tell you how many times we saw those boats go off into Table Rock Lake and do a little tour. And uh, I'll never forget just these evenings where the humidity was like, like a warm blanket, right? And the fireflies are out. And at Branson Landing, there is this, like, this really cool fountain and fireworks thing that happens. And it's amazing to me as I think about that tragedy, that this accident happened in a vacation town where people weren't worried about death. They weren't worried about that. That was the last thing that would have been in anybody's mind. And yet, as they went out onto that boat, a storm came up and the boat started to take on water. And there was an account from from a 12-year-old girl who was there with her grandmother And as she relayed the story of what happened on the boat, she was one of the few survivors. She told her dad that I remember feeling the hands of my grandmother pushing her towards the surface. And her grandmother didn't make it. Can I tell you, friends, that when and what you think of as a sacrifice before is not actually a sacrifice. Sacrifice will not motivate anyone to do anything but love will and love is so much stronger and bigger than any sacrifices than we could make that grandmother wasn't thinking about i'm i'm about to make a a a a sacrifice so that my daughter can live all she could think about was how can my daughter live i love her so much I promise you that's what she's thinking. If you're a grandmother or a grandfather, if you're a parent of a child, there's nothing that you won't do to sacrifice so that your child can experience life. And there is a a 12-year-old girl who is alive today because her grandma made the sacrifice. What are the things that God is calling us to sacrifice so that the lost can find Christ, so that the next generation can know him? It's not actually a sacrifice. I want you to tap in to the incredible, passionate love that God has for you, <laughs> that, that he was motivated out of love to push Christ out of heaven. Christ didn't feel pushed. He came so that we could experience life with God. This is what God's mission is, to bring people back into relationship with him. And there are just some things that, that, that we carry with us that they just, they can go, they can be for the cause. And God can use those sacrifices to bring more people to him. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to make a difference for eternity. Verse 33 says, and they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve. And he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and he put him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. God's mission requires servant leadership. As we follow Jesus in this mission, to reach people. God is shaping us. He's changing our perspective about how the world that we've grown up in works. This is part of how God frees us from a slavery mindset. So many of us are captivated by greatness and what it would mean to be great in this world, and yet Jesus knows the answer to that is not to pursue greatness, but to pursue people who are hurting to serve, to think of ourselves 
less than we think of ourselves. It's actually this question that puts us in need of Jesus to die on the cross to begin with, that most of us want to try and figure out how we can be great. And in the process of trying to become great, we'll never become great. It's very counterintuitive the way Jesus talks about kingdom. What we think is true actually isn't true. Well, to be great, it means to build a big business and have a big family and have a this or that. And really, Jesus says, that's not the metric in which I want you to measure your leadership. I want you to measure your leadership by who you're serving and by how you're serving. And yet his disciples are really focused not on kids, not on the people that God is showing him they need to be thinking about, but on themselves. Is very common, and uh, I struggle with it a lot. I think about people in our congregation who have made sacrifices for the kingdom. Uh, I, and I, th- I think about how God has used them, not only in their careers, but in their ministries, and in the way that I see how uh, they exist in their marriages and in the context where they have relationships. And it's actually pretty inspiring. There's a gal in our church who... I don't know if she's here today. Her name's Becky Wynn. Sharon referenced her last, last week as someone who could help you if you are afraid of children. <laughs> We're trying to get people to volunteer for VBS and to minister for kids, right? And uh, it, it's pretty cool because we're currently, we're currently at, at, at about 200 capacity. And we've got uh, enough funds to pay for 250 kids, uh, but we only have enough small group leaders to be able to ha- handle about, a, about 200 kids. And so we're, we're trying to encourage people, but not, you know, twist people's arms too much, but we're trying to encourage people that this is an incredible opportunity to serve children, which really falls in line with what Jesus is saying. And it just so happens that our, that our church has a rate of reaching kids that is, uh, that is pretty extraordinary. Most VBSs have about 5% of the kids that participate that are, uh, that are not kids that have grown up in church. And so far, as the numbers are coming in for the kids that are a, a part of uh, what's happening, that number for, for what we're doing is at about 37%. Now, what that means is, is if we get up to 250 kids, that number could be uh, between 45 and 60 families that are not a part of a church anywhere, not anywhere in Orange County. And it, it, it's not like you have to compete with other churches to participate in God's mission in Orange County. There's lots of people who need Jesus, right? And so this is a really cool outreach that we're using to, to partner with God and to connect our people to the heart of God and really to reach kids. And so uh, one of the stories that I heard just this last week was one of the children of one of the mothers in our congregation invited their neighbors and uh, the neighbor's mom said, no, 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 that's church. I don't want you to be a part of it. But then decided that out of respect for the neighbor's child and out of respect for their own child, that they would allow them to participate if they were to so choose. And I mean, these stories are a part of the stories of these kids that are coming in to this program where we're hoping to introduce them to Jesus, right? Right. And so for a couple hours every morning for five days, you could be a part of something that I believe Jesus is all about, serving kids. And it's not just about kids. It really is about the people that no one is serving. Because in Jesus' day, it's pretty obvious the kids were the bottom of the totem pole. Who for you is at the bottom of the totem pole? You may be working full time and you just can't. But who at your workplace is at the bottom of the social stratosphere, right? No one talks to them. No one befriends them. You walk into the, 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 the staff room at work, and there's always that one socially awkward guy. You know what I'm saying? Like, usually that's me. Uh, but there, there's got to be someone at your workplace that no one talks to, that no one is interested in, in your classroom. And maybe the, it's someone in your neighborhood that, yeah, yeah, that guy that always yells at the kids, right? Well, what is it in his life that's causing him to yell at those kids? How can we follow Jesus to the people that no one's talking to? You know what's crazy about this principle is if you will take this principle and think about the business world, 
it, it, it's amazing the possibilities. I read this book called Blue Ocean Strategy, and Blue Ocean Strategy is a, bu- a business book that's all about combining two known ideas and creating a market <laughs> for something that doesn't exist. This happened when Apple created the smartphone, right? He noticed something that no one else was doing, and he created a market for himself. I mean, if you're a business person thinking like Jesus, not about all of the cool people or the popular people that everyone else is pursuing, but if you would pursue the, the people that no one else is, it's amazing that this has impact into all sorts of parts of our world. And he created a market for the smartphone. Eventually, all sorts of other tech companies jumped in there. But the reality is Apple had such a head start, it created just this powerful momentum. It's powerful truth to me that Jesus, even back in his day, is not thinking only about who everyone expects him to reach. He's thinking about God's mission, who is for everyone. And he brings up kids because no one's ministering to kids. No one has a heart for kids. What would it look like for your life to be a life heavily invested in God's mission, but thinking about what isn't happening, who isn't being ministered to? Just look around. There are empty seats. Who isn't here? Who isn't a part of God's family? And I know that we can't reach everyone, but all of us can reach someone. And if we will allow God to shape our hearts, to follow Jesus as a servant, I know that God will use you. At the beginning of this message, I asked you, how many of you want God to use you? And yet, when you come to that moment where the Holy Spirit is showing you, that I want you to go talk to that person. Fear or something rises up in us, and we're like, oh, I can't do it, but God, God is good. He can, he will. He, he will use you to connect with that person in such a unique way. Can you believe that it was a child that invited another child whose parents don't, aren't a part of a church to VBS, and now that child is going to be exposed to the message of hope and life and freedom in Jesus? And God has exponential opportunities just waiting for you if you will allow Jesus to lead you like a servant is led to wherever and to whoever to reach whoever it is that God wants you to reach. His disciples aren't there yet, and so we can be assured that God will have grace for us as we are learning how to be more like Jesus on the mission. Verse 38, John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him (laughs) because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work In my name, circle those three words, in my name, will be able soon afterwards to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. We can't forget, friends, that God's mission is just so much bigger than us. It's so much bigger than any of us, our gifts, our talents, our abilities, our denomination, our church. It's just bigger. In order for God to reach everyone, he's going to have to use everyone. (laughs) And I... I keep thinking about the rugged individualism that North America embodies as a value. And in some ways, it's amazing because we have these great ideas and we step out in faith and we go after something. But we also forget sometimes that we are tethered to a mission that is not our own. And we're tethered to a people that don't always think like us or do things like us or have the same opinions as us, and part of the way God reaches people is through the imperfections of this community doing life together. It's the family of God in the imperfections of how they relate and connect and share opinions and disagree and agree and minister to people that God fulfills his mission. 
I have wondered, too, about the placement of this particular passage because the disciples have just have had this interesting encounter with Christ, with Jesus, because he, they failed at casting out a demon. Remember? That, that was last week. And here, in the next part, they're following Jesus on his mission on the way to Jerusalem, and they see these people trying to cast out demons, and their insecurities rise up. That person is doing something that I think I'm gifted to do. Or they don't walk with us, Jesus. We're in your church. We practice the right doctrine. And God is just saying, man, if there are people who need to be free from demons, and they're freeing people from demons in my name, right, there's going to be some qualifications for who we partner with and who we celebrate. But why doesn't the church today... Celebrate people when they succeed in God's mission. I mean, I'm grateful for all of the kinds of different churches that exist today. And, and, and hear me here, I'm grateful for all the different kinds of teams that exist in this church and the different kinds of individuals that exist in this church. God hasn't created you to be the same as the person sitting next to you. You know why? Because that person next to you might be able to reach that person better than you. Do you know why God's allowed you to become this profession? Because your unique gift set is going to be utilized by the Holy Spirit in a specific way in this role. And maybe that's not Tara's calling. God is going to use the weaknesses and the things that you think are broken to bring life into people. This last week I saw someone who was a part of our congregation who I've been counseling with and just we've just been connecting and, and they have a really hard backstory. Uh, uh, they, they've really struggled through some things. And yet God is using some of those struggles to connect with and to, and to, and to minister in, in, in the way that Christ has uniquely equipped them because of the way they've experienced the grace of God in their life and the empathy that's been created. And yet if we're so focused on ministry from our perspective and who we're hanging out with, God cannot use people and extend his reach into community in a way that he's intended. And that happens inside of a church just as much as it happens outside of a church. We get so insecure when people operate differently than we do. And yet I've discovered in my life that when I connect with people who are really different than me, it helps to bring the best out in me. Because God has uniquely designed us to be dependent on one another to accomplish his mission. Can you imagine if Todd, a former Marine, were to be tasked with winning the war of whatever? Okay, Todd, here's North Korea. Go at it. I mean, it's the most, it's the craziest idea that we could ever try to wrap our minds around, that God isn't interested in our partnership, not just because he used different kinds of people, but because we will grow as we are freed of these insecurities. So why don't we celebrate when people succeed? Why don't we celebrate when this person attempts something that we've always wanted to do, but we've never been able to get done? I think God is glorified when people accomplish his mission in all sorts of different ways, in all sorts of different people, in all sorts of different churches, in all sorts of different methods. There are so many different ways for Jesus to make a real difference in the lives of people. And maybe they're not all meant to look cookie cutter just like everyone else. This... uh, this sculpture I have up here is, uh, is one of my favorites, and it sits right on my desk. I got it in Israel. It's a piece of olive wood that has been sculpted of a shepherd, Jesus, I'm assuming, although the face is blank, although I don't really know what Jesus looks like, so I'm assuming, again. And there's a sheep next to him, and there's a sheep on his shoulders And it reminds me of that song that there's so much controversy over about God's reckless love. 
One thing about that song that nobody can argue with is that God loves people so much that he's willing to go to whatever length to reach people. And one thing that I've discovered as I've just been paying attention to this is that oftentimes in our, in our mission with Christ, we take too much upon ourselves. And we assume too much about our role in the process of God's mission. And I think some of us need to remember that we're the sheep on his shoulders. Or we're the sheep next to his knee. And there may be moments when we, like the shepherd, reach out and connect with and serve. But we can't forget that the process of mission itself is designed to fulfill the mission of God in us. In other words, as we partner with Christ, we actually become a conduit of God's grace and mercy working in us. Because when you take the most significant step of saying, God, I trust you, God doesn't make you immediately perfect and qualified for what he is that he's going to ask you to do. He's going to use you despite all of your imperfections, despite all the ways that you still need to grow, and slowly along this journey of walking with the shepherd, God will use you in some pretty incredible ways to make a real difference in the lives of people. Would you stand with me? There's a song that we're going to sing as we close. It's called More Like Jesus. And the words go something like this. You came to the world you created, trading your crown for a cross. You willingly died. Your innocent life paid the cost. Counting your status as nothing, the king of all kings came to serve, washing my feet, covering me with your love. The chorus goes something like this. If more of you means less of me, take everything. Yes, all of you is all I need. Take everything. O oh Lord, change me like you only can. Here with my heart in your hands. Father, I pray, make me more like Jesus. This world is dying to know who you are. You've shown us the way to your heart. So, Father, I pray, make me more like Jesus. Oh, Lord, change me like only you can. Here with my heart in your hands, Father, I pray, make me more like Jesus. Make me more like Jesus. Father, I pray, Father, I pray, make me more like Jesus. What if God's mission is way simpler than most of us has made it? What if his mission is you. And God uses mission to change you. And if other people come to Christ through the process of that, wonderful. I resonated with a statement that I heard two weeks ago. They said, we don't use people to grow ministry. We use ministry to grow people. See, I think some of you need to remember that God uses you so that you'll grow, so that you'll become more like Christ, so that as you give, as you serve, as you spend time, you will literally be shaped like a sculpture in the image of Christ, fitted for whatever cross he's called you to carry. And friends, it won't be a sacrifice. You will feel like you have been designed your entire life to do exactly what God has called you to do. Orange County is so hungry for people who will partner with Jesus and go out on the mission that he has called us to. But it's got to start with letting God work on us. God wants to change you this morning. Would you bow your heads with me? If you just feel exhausted this morning because of the sacrifice that you've personally been making, I want to encourage you, God wants to fill you up. If you've really missed the who and you have been ministering to people that it feels like they just, they just don't care, maybe God wants to realign you to people who are more receptive to what God wants to do through you. Maybe you need to look for people who are alone, 
who others have forgotten. And maybe this morning you're a leader that needs to just allow God to take your insecurities. Maybe you've been doing this thing like a lone ranger and it's time to join a team and to work together with others to see this incredible task accomplished through your life. What will happen will be you will become more like Christ through that process. If any of those things are true of you, I'd just like you to bow your heads and just offer yourself to the Lord. God's mission includes you. Would you surrender yourself to him this morning as we sing more like Jesus?